And we will now move uh, to the next topic, which is uh, rewilding European landscapes. Uh, and for that, I invite Frank van Langevelde. Um, he's chair of the Wildlife Ecology and Conservation Group at Wageningen University, uh, and he will chair this part of the program. Thank you, Lisbeth. Hello, audience. Great that you're connected to us. So rewilding is giving room to natural processes so that nature can manage itself. However, how does it work? And especially, how does it work in practice? We will first watch a short video on rewilding in practice in uh, the rewilding area in the Rodopi Mountains in Bulgaria. This is the Rodopi Mountains, a rich landscape that supports a wide array of wildlife species, flowers and insects. Overlapping the border between Bulgaria and Greece, this area's wide array of terrain allows a host of different species to thrive in the region. With its mosaic of open landscapes, oak and beech forests, grasslands and rivers, as well as rocky slopes and cliffs, it's the perfect habitat for some of Eastern Europe's most important species. Regarding biodiversity, it couldn't be better. Eh? This is, this is the, the European hotspot for biodiversity. You can't find any place in Europe where with more diverse flora and fauna than this. The Rewilding Rodopi Mountains team, along with our local partners, are reintroducing naturally grazing herbivores to restore an entire food chain and to support the endangered vulture species in the area. By reintroducing the red deer, fallow deer, rewilded horses and European bison through releases, it will allow predators and scavengers to thrive again. The knock-on effect of increasing these species is not just with animals, but with the environment itself, allowing for the creation of new mosaic landscapes. But at the same time, this area has a big problem because people are leaving this area. And that means that from a very diverse, half-open landscape now, the, the landscape slowly grows through with forests, with uh, shrubs. Bringing back herbivore, that's the, the tipping point from a system that closes to a system that opens up to the rich biodiversity which belongs to this area. The intersection of these processes leads to constantly evolving landscapes rather than fixed habitats. This dynamic is key to preserving Europe's rich biodiversity. And in creating these mosaic landscapes, we hope to see a natural increase in the populations of the endangered Lake, tortoises, and many other species that depend on these habitats. This explosion of wildlife is also bringing tourism back into the region. We have set up some really interesting stuff, so we are building a network of local entrepreneurs. Seeing this today, people visiting the bed and breakfast and the visitor center and a really growing group of people visiting the area, that's a hopeful thing. Through our work, we're bringing wildlife and important ecological processes back into the Rodopis and allowing nature to take care of itself and allow local communities to benefit from a new perspective for their region. We just saw a short video from the Rodopi Mountains in Bulgaria, a rewilding area where rewilding Europe is uh, realizing large-scale uh, rewilding. And I would like to start with a poll question. So please take out your phones and have the app ready. And the question is, the Rodopi Mountains is one of the highlights in rewilding. Yeah, so, and now the question is, to better understand rewilding in this area, we need to do something. We need to need to more knowledge, to more studies on either the role of large herbivores, sustainable tourism, all kinds of economic activities, or should we focus on biodiversity and ecosystem services? So please vote now. We'll get back to the results after the presentation uh, that we will hear in a couple of minutes. I would like to introduce uh, Frans Scheper, which is our next speaker. And Frans is a managing director of, uh, and one of the founding fathers of uh, Rewilding Europe. 
And Rewilding Europe is a cross-European initiative with team members working in 17 different countries. Many of these initiatives are making progress, demonstrating how rewilding benefits nature as well as people. Uh, Frans will give you the latest insights and will uh, make a case for, for scaling up this approach in restoration. And I'd like to remind you that during the presentation, you can all kinds ask, ask all kinds of questions to us using the app, but also on the poll. Please react on the poll. And after the presentation, we'll come back to your questions that you just uh, post. So Frans, welcome at the Rewilding Symposium. Thanks. Please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much, um, uh, Frank. Um, Paul was a great story that really created a beautiful uh, sort of warming up for, for my story, which is uh, going to focus on putting practice at center stage when we talk about rewilding. And um, uh, so my, my, my talk will be about our work mostly. Um, I've taken this first picture of the Iberian lynx because for me, apart from that, an incredibly beautiful animal. It's also a symbol of how resilient nature is. This, this cat species was nearly disappeared. Uh, the first spe cat species after the sable-toothed tiger, so imagine, from our own European backyard, but we managed to save it, and it's doing very well now. It's reproducing, it's spreading, and it's an incredible symbol of the resilience of nature, which is, I think, the, the overall red line and, 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 and thread in my, my presentation. It's an interesting time, and, and, and I think no one else could pr explain this better than, than Paul, and he just did, so I'm very, very delighted with that. And if you look at some of the recent publications, and I have to say, this really is a land landmark publication in science uh, last year, for the first time ever, by uh, Andrea Perino and a lot of other authors, um, uh, presenting and, and publishing about uh, this new concept, a, a new conce conceptual framework of rewilding in science. Um, very, very, uh, uh, art, a very interesting article for, for you all to read. But at the same time, there were also there was a publication in biological conservation where people were saying, "Why do we need rewilding? We're doing this already. We call this re restoration. What is novel about this?" So it's an interesting debate going on within the scientific community about this new narrative that Paul explained about. But there's also other publications, and if you look at the statistics, it's skyrocketing the number of publications, scientific publications about rewilding. Most of them are very opinion uh, r related, not so much based on real science and, and peer review. But you know, even for regions, articles about how could uh, rewilding become a new paradigm for conservation, and for instance, Scotland. And we all saw this beautiful little film this morning, or hopefully most of you saw this beautiful film. Uh, of David Attenborough this morning, and um, this was a, a, a production he did last year. But if you if you look at his latest, where he was asking the question, "Can we rewild the world?" But if you look at his last production, "Alive on Our Planet," which was just broadcasted a few weeks ago, he's actually saying we must rewild the world. So he made in a short time he made for himself also a shift in thinking that. This is something that needs to happen. And of course, if you have started like with my fellow friends and you just saw uh, Walter Helmer in the Rodopi film, he started an initiative around rewilding, then of course, this is a really uh, moment of celebration if somebody like say, Sir David Attenborough um, uh, says something like this. I would like to start my story, uh, oh, sorry, and then uh, what, I, what, what we see is at the same time, although he is saying this, uh, David Attenborough, rewilding is not something new, and I will explain more about it. It might not have that name, but look at these publications. I think these publications of books about rewilding are just a few years old. The, the term rewilding didn't exist in Europe just 10 years ago, and look, where it's all over the place now. We have all these publications coming out. Uh, not only in Europe, but also in other continents, in French, in Spanish, in English, in Swedish, and so on. So that's all very interesting, and there's a lot of stuff, interesting stuff to read about rewilding as we speak. But I would like to start my story in the Netherlands, because I'm Dutch, and although I'm leading a European initiative with, with my colleagues and friends, um, this is where I started my career, and, and Paul already mentioned a lot about it. And I, when, I, when I finished my study, um, that was in the mid-80s. Uh, that, ex that was exactly the moment when some of the new, the new thinking uh, responding to this, this awakening came up. And I want to refer to two particular reports that really sort of 
sparked my enthusiasm for this and actually became guiding in my, my, all my, my, my work after those years. And the first one is Plan Stork, which was a new vision on, on river floodplains in the Netherlands by a team of, of uh, people with different, different uh, expertise coming with an incredible vision for how our rivers could be restored, apart from water quality, uh, mostly about the functioning of rivers. And there was another one, which, uh, uh, which I actually came out when I was working in the same Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Nature Management, which was called Nature Development, which was produced by uh, Fred Barsemann and Franz Vera, which uh, for the first time ever uh, presented uh, a, a picture of how we could uh, be much more offensive uh, when it comes to nature conservation in Europe. And the first ideas about this ecological uh, network across our country. So this new discourse really shaped my, my, my work and um, uh, the Osphorosplossen has been mentioned, the explosion of life that we saw after this polder didn't succeed in, in, in its original attention. It became a huge uh, freshwater marsh, really blow, blew everyone away. This plant stork and also living rivers concept, uh, coinciding with floods that we had in the early 90s, really sparked big rewilding restoration of rivers in, in our country. And as I said before, it was not the term rewilding that we were using. Of course, we had our own Dutch word, which is called nature development. That was the term uh, that, that we used. And, and I'm talking 35 years ago. So in, in that sense, rewilding isn't new. And, uh, uh, and um, I found myself in, uh, in a situation where I could really build on this new idea and, uh, and, and, and put rewilding into practice. And one of the projects I've been uh, working for in, uh, for a period of, of more than 12 years is uh, as a river stretch for 50 kilometers of rivers. It has been completely rebuilt. I think it's one of the largest infrastructure projects in the Netherlands after our famous Dutch Delta Works, uh, with a turnover around 700 million euro, where uh, flood protection, gravel and sand mining combined with ecological restoration was carried out, and where we've seen an amazing effect uh, for people and for nature as we speak. And I would love uh, to invite you to, uh, to visit this area and see the incredible response of nature uh, being allowed to, to, to play its role. Another very famous uh, rewilding area in the Netherlands is uh, the Gelder Support Area near Nijmegen, uh, where um, a, a, a very interesting connection was made between clay extraction and, and creating more space for rivers to allow natural processes to bounce back. And this was one of the big uh, initiatives that my colleague Walter Helmer uh, was, uh, was, a, was an important player and an initiator of. So, um, so these Dutch ideas that, uh, that were developed have, have really shaped a lot of our thinking, and um, I will get to Europe in a second. But these are the four points I think we can learn uh, that came out of these, uh, uh, of these Dutch experiences on rewilding. So first of all, nature itself can be a creative power, flexible and resourceful if we give it space and time. That was really one of those awakening moments for, for a lot of people that worked in conservation in Europe and, and broader. But also that uh, we can also look at reference points before we started occupying Europe, uh, wild, uh, wild uh, landscapes and natural processes to have, uh, uh, to have guidance and inspiration from if we create those no, new types of natures. Um, but also that nature conservation that was very much uh, associated with nature behind fences and protected and you were not able to get in uh, um, with modern society and, um, um, and where people and, and, and economy can also benefit and where people are welcomed. So there's nothing about trying to push people out. This is exactly the opposite, in fact. And, and, and also uh, very clearly that uh, rewilding and the way it can be done, like in the examples I mentioned, uh, really can also uh, uh, offer novel solutions for all kinds of challenges that we face, including climate change. So let's go to Europe. And Europe is changing, we all know that. We, Europe is, is countryside is changing big time, you know, apart from uh, demographic changes, um, also cultural, po political, geopolitical changes. We're all aware of this and we hear about it every day. But look, let's have a look at the countryside. And I think we see a development there where indeed uh, this uh, rural depopulation is happening at large scale already for decades and it will continue to happen. 
If you look at the figures, four out of five Europeans currently live in urban areas already, and there's millions of hectares that are being uh, abandoned uh, from agricultural use. Uh, these are studies that have been done already in 2010, but there's more recent information. And on this map, you see the darker the green, the, more, the higher the level of land abandonment that is actually happening. And the main drivers for that is that mostly young people, like a lot of you, uh, the students that are watching today, uh, they have decided to go to university and go to city and build up a life in 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 in, in a city environment and uh, so there was a very strong sort of um a reason uh, for, uh, for that, but and you see old generations staying behind. And in many of these areas, we have to realize, are very marginal areas where when people, uh, the population in Europe was very much expanding, people started occupying high, high mountain areas, uh, uh, very poor soils, and they start, tried to start a living there. And maybe those days that was possible. But looking at sort of the, the competitive agriculture and, and economy that we have, those are also very marginal areas from that perspective. And of course, this has huge socioeconomic impacts. If you, if you go to the Carpathians in Romania and you speak with a mayor who's telling you, 50% of my people left, the school is closed, no children born, uh, no shops anymore, you know, that's not a, that's not a great story. And, and, but it, it's also reality. And, and what we see a lot is that uh, people respond by saying, we should keep this alive, this, this old landscape. We should pour subsidies in. The European Commission pour subsidies into these areas. And you can ask yourself the question, is that really a sustainable way of looking into the future? Or is this maybe a problem which we could also turn it into an opportunity? And this is one of the big sort of awakening moments for us in rewilding Europe. Uh, you know, why is nobody addressing this and why are we just trying to keep it as it is and why doesn't anyone think about new solutions uh, for this? And it's important to realize that because, uh, because people are leaving the countryside, these enormous numbers of livestock, grazing livestock that were all in our mountains and, and landscapes are also disappearing big time. Um, if you look at pictures from the Alps, from the Pyrenees, from, uh, from, from the Apennines in Italy, heavily overgrazed. The Netherlands was heavily overgrazed. Scotland, as you see it now, heavily overgrazed. These bare landscapes are not the natural landscapes that Europe could have. And so you have to realize that because of this grazing livestock uh, declining, there is, there is a huge impact of this. And um, um, what we see more and more is that the landscapes that are very suitable for intensive agriculture become ecological deserts, and it's not only silent spring anymore, but it's also silent autumn, silent winter, and silent summer in these places. On the other hand, the, the small-scale landscapes that people were sort of using and, and farming uh, are also disappearing and become young forests. And so we get this sort of digital landscape where everything in between bare soil and closed canopy forest, and where most or a huge part of our, our richness of species is living, um, is, is sort of disappearing. And, and this is something that we, we really have to uh, think about. And it's, you could also say that the first time in history of Europe when we've lost already our natural grazes that were roaming Europe big time uh, before people, people came, then replaced mostly by livestock, um, th which is now also disappearing, that large tracts of European landscapes miss natural grazing at this moment in time. And that has huge consequences. And, and, and as I said, you know, many species of insects, butterflies, birds, they need these open patchy mosaic landscapes that are now disappearing at scale. So we end up with a story which is indeed not so positive because uh, if you look at you know, the level of degradation of European landscapes, and, and here you see a map uh, which uh, depicts ecological integrity, you see there's a lot of yellow and there's, there's, a lot of the, there's still areas with green. And if you zoom into those areas, you can see that, for instance, Scandinavia, if you look at forestry, it looks all green, but it's heavy, heavy plantation and heavy forest industry there. And this is, of course, a picture that, uh, that, that you, you, you look at and say, OK, so what is it we can do? And um, there has been an incredible, beautiful film was produced last year called, uh, or two years ago, Serengeti Rules, uh, also another one to look if you, if you have the time which asks these questions, uh, uh, which, which ask this question at the end, saying, can a downgraded system be upgraded? Is that even possible? And, and this is, of course, you know, the subject of today. 
It's interesting to see all the degradation, and we saw the, the Living Planet Index uh, decline. At the same time, we see an incredible wildlife comeback in Europe happening. Started in the 70s or some species a bit earlier, and we see these amazing increases of species, and, and there's dozens and dozens of species that are actually doing well, especially the larger bodied species. And uh, everyone knows the story about the wolf, but there's also pelicans, there's eagles, there is, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, beavers, red deer, wild boar, a lot of uh, species are, are expanding. And together with the Zoological Society of London and, and BirdLife, uh, 2030, we published this report just to learn and to analyze why are species coming back, uh, you know, despite all the declines we see around us. And, um, and that's a really uh, interesting analysis that, that, that we did. And we're now sort of updating this report that will be published in two years' time to look at what happened since then. Um, but what, the main reasons are actually legal protection through the Habitats and Birds Directive. And this is a really unique, strong piece of legislation that we have in Europe that has really helped. But also, of course, dedicated uh, conservation work of so many organizations and people. But also um, a different attitude of people. Um, you know, um, wildlife is becoming more relaxed. I think everyone, a lot of people have seen in the news during COVID, you know, that suddenly animals appeared in, in urban areas. This is not because they are increasing, but because they felt like, hey, now it's safe here, less people, let's have a look. And also people are getting more relaxed to wildlife as people are becoming more urbanized. You know, then there's a different sort of attitude and feel about animals that, that are around. And, um, and also on the countryside, um, there is more tolerance. Otherwise, those species wouldn't have uh, make this big comeback. Um, and of course, it is an incredible opportunity to see wildlife. And, and in Europe, we have to realize that we got used to very shy animals that instead of diurnal became nocturnal, are there in very low densities. And, uh, and now we have to get used again to, to animals around the corner. And apart from uh, having, uh, uh, you know, these can be sometimes different neighbors and, and we have to find new ways of living in coexistence with these species. And, and the net result is positive. So despite all the challenges, there is, there is a positive story to tell here. Uh, one of the latest connections that was made between rewilding and and uh, and climate was uh, uh, was done also only recently after the Paris Agreement, where people realized more and more that um, there's a huge potential to reduce emissions and adapt through large-scale nature recovery. So the climate agenda really came in very strong, um, and in potential it can enable rewilding landscape at a at a at a, at a large scale and in a cost-effective way with many other co-benefits apart from carbon uh, capturing, and um, this will be a strong driver for rewilding. That's really what 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 I expect is that climate the climate agenda. You know, at the end of the day, those are two sides of the the same coin: biodiversity and climate. That can be a really strong and, and large-scale driver for for rewilding, but we need uh, big steps to be taken here, including. Uh, all kinds of uh, investment uh, opportunities for, uh, for, for, for making this happen at scale. I'll get back to that later. And it's important to realize that if we talk about rewilding, this is not to create wilderness. Uh, the goal of rewilding is also not to go back to the past and, and restore something that we then cure, uh, a cure as, a, as an old painting. There is a gradual scale. Imagine you have a scale of, of 1 to 10, like you see here where one is the middle of a city, a parking place without any wildlife and tennis wilderness, which I don't think we have pure wilderness anymore in Europe, at, at least not uh, in a larger scale. And moving up the scale of wildness, that is actually the process of rewilding. The wilder, you know, the, the higher its course. And, and this example I showed you here in the middle, uh, you can think about forests and rivers, but this example is about wilder rivers. So making a move from completely regulated rivers to wild rivers and taking out dams and, and dikes and, and, and restore flooding, that's a process of rewilding that, that, you, can, uh, that, you, can, that you can follow. Um, and we worked out this rewilding scale also in another uh, scientific publication that was done, and uh, Patrick uh, Janssen will refer to this later this afternoon, about you can actually, how you can actually... Um, not only monitor rewilding, but also set targets for it. So just summarizing, um, people ask me often, so what is different? Why is rewilding different from, from, uh, from traditional conservation, if you like? And uh, 
the, my summary would be that uh, it is a new and positive appreciation of wild nature in a continent where we all grew up in a, in a cultivated landscape and where we think that we need to manage and control everything. It's also a key element, a key element is also that biodiversity is not derived from we deciding this plant has to grow in this particular meadow, but it's actually a result of natural processes. Uh, it is future oriented, but it's definitely learning from the past. It is more cost effective compared to recurrent management that we do in many of our areas and which is actually, there's not sufficient funding to do that in this way at this scale in Europe. But it's also connecting, or if you like, reconnecting modern society with wild nature in the 21st century through a lot of different ways, including building new nature-based economies in those uh, areas and regions that suffer from rural depopulation, for instance. And it's, as I said, not a dogmatic idea about we need to create wilderness, but we actually move up a scale of wildness where the limits of how far you can reach on that scale is not maybe not so much... Uh, depending on the physical environment, of course it is, but maybe more even on the so, uh, by the social acceptance of how wild we want a place or a landscape to be. What we do as Rewilding Europe, um, we practice uh, because it's beautiful to have a vision and ideas and a theory, but we want to see how this happens in the real world. And we decided to pioneer this in a number of areas, now eight, hopefully 10, and all these areas were nominated to us. So it was demand driven and the leadership and and ownership of these initiatives is not with a central organization, but it's by local teams and local organizations that we've helped to build this up. And these areas really uh, are for us important demonstration site of, uh, sites of how rewilding can work in different parts of Europe, different socioeconomic contexts and different ecological systems. And I'll take you through a few of those. And of course, you can look at our website. Uh, but what we decided is that each of these areas would have a specific theme. We cannot, we cannot do everything everywhere, but certain areas have specific topics that we address in these, in these landscapes. For instance, this great Accor Valley in Portugal, everyone knows Portugal has big problems with fires, excessive fires, and part of the reason is uh, not only forestry, but also lack of grazing. So we're looking at how we can restore these more natural forests, but also re reduce the risk of fire through natural grazing and, uh, and build a big uh, corridor in, in this uh, landscape where we connect um, with, uh, with economic activities. Uh, that uh, where young entrepreneurs and people are, are taking taking uh, the initiative. Another one is Villabit Mountains in Croatia, uh, along the Adri Adriatic Sea, where we are actually uh, renting ourselves uh, hunting concessions to control wildlife now in a, quite a big area, and where we want to make uh, and see a transformation from hunting. Uh, traditional hunting systems to, uh, to a, a wildlife economy that's based on wildlife watching and all the associated activities. And that's a really interesting pioneering uh, initiative. There's only one other organization in Europe, in Romania, that is, that is uh, as a conservation organization, uh, buying hunting concessions to then show other ways of wildlife management. Another area is big wetland area on the other side of, of, of Europe. If you look at it from the Dutch Delta perspective, the Danube Delta, where we are restoring big wetlands, 40,000 hectares, uh, where we are restoring uh, natural dynamics, uh, reflooding, and um, bringing a, a, a huge new possibilities for, for the local communities, both in terms of fishing, but also nature-based uh, tourism, particularly. The Apennines in Italy is a completely different topic where we're looking at connecting five big protected areas with uh, what we call coexistence corridors, where in particular mask and brown bear, but also other species can move from one protected area to the other, because those parks in themselves are too small for viable populations. And of course, when you have these corridors, this is where uh, uh, wildlife is migrating through areas where people live. Although there's huge land abandonment, there's people that have beehives and and, and, and have conflicts with, with these species. And we're setting up new models around uh, mitigating these conflicts or even better, uh, making sure people benefit from, from those animals. And the last one I want to show you here is the Southern Carpathians in Romania, where we're actually building a local economy based on, on a completely new bison population. We've started releasing European bison in this area in 2014. Uh, it's now supported also by the European Commission and we're looking at a free roaming viable bison population of at least 150 animals to start with as a, as, a, as a representative of a large connected landscape. And we see already many uh, 
uh, local people embarking on this idea and, uh, and starting businesses around bison and, 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 and connect lots of, lots of other activities with this iconic species that is suddenly next door. And we'll see in the break a beautiful film uh, how the local communities uh, are involved and respond to the comeback of the species that was, 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 was gone for 200 years. So, uh, this is the title of my presentation, How Can We Make Sure That uh, Practice Moves Centre Stage? And uh, it is interesting to see that, uh, and actually we are quite gifted in Europe with many initiatives at landscape level, uh, small and large, that, uh, that are actually trying to put this in practice. And this is a map I want to show you. So we have our own areas, um, they all qualify of uh, rewilding potential of around 100,000 hectares or more. So we're talking about scale, not about small, small, small projects, but really about areas and long-term commitments in these areas with the teams that, that, that are working on this. We're looking at three more areas as rewilding Europe. Um, you can see them popping up here in Spain, France and Scotland. And then there is another uh, interesting initiative, a grant-making program, uh, basically it is the Endangered Landscapes Program in, uh, run from Cambridge in the UK, which is also supporting large landscape uh, restoration with similar principles. And uh, those are now eight areas. You see the yellow ones, orange ones popping up here. And also there is a, a whole range of new, uh, new potential areas that are being looked at, at as we speak. So if you add this all up, we have in Europe around 2025 really interesting, uh, call it uh, field laboratories, places where the new ideas develop, as Paul said, um, uh, which, uh, which are a great subject for, for science, I would say. And um, sorry, and, and one addition is that apart from these larger landscapes, um, there is also the European Rewilding Network with uh, now 55 more sites um, addition, in addition to these places you see here, where people small scale, uh, different topics working on, on rewilding ideas. So there's a lot happening in Europe. And if we talk about practice, it's actually happening. And, um, and, and we need to look at how, how this can be uh, also become much more relevant for science and research. Um, so these are all these places, and how do we do rewilding in, in practice? Um, we have focused our entire initiative around five themes that you could say form the DNA of what we are about. First of all, wilder nature, which means more natural processes, supporting wildlife comeback, uh, forming then a base for new nature economies in those areas and create more pride uh, and identity for those regions. And we hope these become inspirational examples that will then be amplified or magnified or scale up, if you like, across Europe. And this sort of brings a spinning wheel that we are trying to, to get turning. Um, just a little bit more about these five areas here. So while the nature, so you've seen the examples of the landscapes where we work, it's, it's basically around enabling natural processes and think about river restoration, as I showed you, reflooding, dam removal, natural grazing, peatland rewetting, woody regeneration. There's lots of things. It's all about creating the right conditions for nature to bounce back and for processes to take, take shape again. That's the key element of, 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 of wilder nature. Wildlife come back. A lot of species, a lot of people immediately think, ah, so you reintroduce species, but actually, 95% of the species come on their own, and uh, as the right conditions are there. Of course, the UK and islands in general are uh, are a bit different, but uh, you know that sort of uh, that uh, expansion of species uh, can happen um, at, at the European continent, and it is happening. And this this wildlife comeback is looking at how can we restore assemblages of species, not individual species, but assemblages of species that interact, restoring those trophic chains. Uh, how can we find new ways of coexistence? As I mentioned before, how do the connectivity element is extremely important if we have wildlife come back, but if there is isolated uh, areas where they have to survive, that might not work in the long term. And also we need to change hunting regimes because that has a huge impact on wildlife. So that then could provide new opportunities. This transition of landscapes could also provide opportunities for local entrepreneurs and businesses. And what we mostly do is to start working with all these different actors in these areas to develop landscape business plans while we explore what are these new business opportunities and how can we make them, them real. And we, we provide finance and access to markets to help those entrepreneurs. And we have already supported dozens and, um, and, and this is uh, maybe the most 
interesting part of rewilding. How can we do this reconnection in a meaningful way that, that it's embraced and, and uh, valued by, by the local, local communities? A very important element is communication. And we call this interest in the wild because it's much more than communication. And it's really about reaching out and inspiring uh, large audiences from the local farmer and the hunter to the people in the European Commission, everything in between, and, how, uh, and see how we can empower those communities to become part and engage with rewilding move, uh, this movement and ultimately providing new identities for some of those regions that really suffered from, from, from the problems I mentioned in the beginning. And local pride in having, you know, like this bison story you will see, uh, having, having wild nature coming back in the next door. But of course, if we have all these beautiful examples across Europe, these are still small spots on the map. And, and I sometimes say we need to move away from um, islands of hope in a sea of misery. How do we scale up? That's the big opportunity and challenge at the same time. So demonstrating rewilding is key. And what is really important here, and we'll get to that later, I, I guess, how can we make rewilding a competitive land use? And, and marginal areas are heavily subsidized making it a very uneven sort of uh, battle between, yes, I, I can farm here as long as I get subsidies, but if those subsidies wouldn't exist, people would not farm there anymore and they would become available. So this is a, a real important question. How do we make rewilding a competitive land use? We need to build new com uh, co coalitions to achieve that with landowners, with, with all sorts of, of stakeholders. So the demonstration, that's the places where it happened that provide the inspiration and learning and lessons for how we can move forward and scale up. It is absolutely important, and Paul alluded to this already, there is no enabling policy for rewilding at the moment. It's very positive that we have now the biodiversity and, and climate agenda linked to each other, and we hope and we're working hard with many organizations to push for rewilding principles to become part of the biodiversity agenda. So moving away from not only protection, but protection and restoration. And what is encouraging, but we have to see how this will work out in practice, is that the EU, in its new EU biodiversity strategy, has put legally binding targets using uh, uh, for, for member states. And of course, what we would like to see is that rewilding principles become part of that. Another important way of scaling up is connecting with the private sector. Conservation for too long has to been too much dependent on public funding, charities, and giving and grant making, but we need the private sector and the financial markets involved. And there's huge interest. Imagine you can imagine you can invest in a business model that makes a forest wilder instead of a forest more monotone. And uh, we're exploring these different middle, uh, business models in different sectors, in water management, in forests, in peat, and others. And, uh, and we need large-scale investments uh, and, and, the f and, the, and funds to make uh, the scaling up possible. And the last one here, last but not least, because that's one of the main topics of today, is how do we then link with science? And this is interesting, and Paul explained a lot about it already, so what could I add? But I would like to say from a practitioner's point of view, monitoring and learning, monitoring and learning is, is absolutely key, building evidence as well. We have fantastic results already in the Netherlands. 30 years of rewilding our rivers has shown an incredible uh, improvement in biodiversity in nature. It hasn't been published sufficiently uh, internationally, unfortunately. Um, that still has to happen, but we need to build evidence but, uh, and monitor and learn by doing. And what I feel is important, and, uh, and we've discussed this quite a lot of times with scientists, that science should not become prescriptive for rewilding. Rewilding is happening, and science should actually try to keep up. And there's many ways of doing that. I think the professorship with Lisbeth is a fantastic step because uh, Lisbeth will, will help to create this community with now already over 20, 25 universities in Europe that have picked up on rewilding. And there's many young people uh, that are interested in this topic, look at today. And um, we have decided to also, uh, well, not we as Rewilding Europe, but some young people have decided to start a young rewilders community in Europe. And uh, they actually did a soft launch of that new initiative uh, two days ago. And, um, and they made this uh, world cloud. And, and so there's uh, 17 young uh, professionals, uh, conservation career mostly, that uh, put words together where they felt, um, how, they, how they felt what is inspiring about rewilding. And, and this is, of course, um, as Liedbert said, there is a new generation coming. And all that action that we have seen in the streets and uh, all that, that anger and maybe even uh, 
um, yeah, frustration about about what is happening with the future, uh, we should be able to uh, we should make sure that we can put that action that 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 th those feelings into real action. And rewilding is it provides a, pers a perspective. The, the the empowerment narrative is definitely something that uh, that gives us hope. And this is where I would like to uh, end my presentation, Frank. Thank you. Thank you, Frans, for your very nice and interesting overview of um, rewilding European landscapes. And it seems that you're rewilding or changing European landscapes drastically. So looking forward to those results. So during the presentation, uh, we received many questions uh, from the audience. So thanks for that. And I would like to start with uh, the one that received the most votes. And I think it's a very interesting question. So we talk about biodiversity a lot when talking about uh, rewilding. However, there is more diversity. So is there also something like geodiversity that should be preserved or increased? What is your reflection on that? I'm actually not so familiar with the term geodiversity. Uh, maybe that already is part of the answer because we are not looking at it in particular, but I assume this is sort of geographical diversity. Things uh, about uh, different soil types, the, different the, uh, yeah. morphologies, um, yeah. abio abiotic processes. Abiotic so, processes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And um, I think some of the examples that I showed is that uh, you know, the abiotic processes haven't, didn't have enough attention. Everybody is talking or mostly about trophic rewilding, which is about nature. But what about soil? What about water? What about all these processes like erosion, sedimentation? I th uh, this is this is the basis for many of those systems to uh, where natural processes come in, and uh, so uh, that's absolutely a key for being successful because it's you know the biodiversity you you, you have in the end is is to a large extent uh, depending on on the functioning of the system itself, so the soil and the water and the climate and all these processes that are that are happening. So I think uh, this is central in in what we do, uh, but I, I fully agree that it needs more attention particular in science, so how, how these call it earth, earth processes can play a much bigger, uh, important role. And yeah, so not only uh, having those pic nice pictures of bears and wolves, yep. but also nice pictures yep. of yep. geomorphologies, for example. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's a beautiful challenge for, for photographers. Okay. The next question is uh, also a, an interesting question. So European farmlands, um, European landscapes, I should say, were mainly created by farmers. In the past, the land was mm -hmm. not that used intensively. And now we are still have those remnants of, uh, of those old ancient farmlands, if I may call them like that, uh, like heathlands, for example. And uh, we tend to protect them, uh, those vulnerable cultural landscapes, for their biodiversity. Should we turn them slowly, but certainly into more natural areas with potentially a greater biodiversity and resilience? What is your Yeah, opinion? that's a good question. And I think it's important to say that rewilding is, shouldn't sort of um, now be seen as, as the only way forward. There's all different ways of, of, of doing conservation. Rewilding, we always say, is an additional way of looking at landscapes and, and, uh, and, 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 and doing conservation. And there is definitely a place for old, old cultural landscapes. Uh, but we have to realize that um, what we have done as people, you know, the way we've developed those landscapes, which have their value, is also extremely costly. Uh, we see them declining everywhere. And, and um, you know, look at our own country in the Netherlands, how hard that is to, to remain, to keep those areas remaining. And uh, so it's definitely an opportunity for that to, 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 to continue uh, supporting these type of landscapes. Um, uh, where, wherever that is, that is a possibility. Um, so we're not saying this is bad or good. We're saying, well, apart from what we have been doing in conservation, which is basically managing cultural landscapes, there's another opportunity also to, to create natural landscapes. And, and often this could be, uh, uh, in many situations, that could actually be a mix. If you look at landscape level, there's always areas where, you know, looking at the scale of wildness, where, which are less wild or more wild. And, and I think there is a mix to be made in many of these landscapes. And actually, that's the case in, in most of the regions where we work. Yeah, but that might be, Frans, I, I, I see your point, but it might be a quite pragmatic approach. So, again, the question is, at the ultimate, is the ultimate goal of, of, of this rewilding process having natural landscapes? Yeah, as natural as possible. And natural as possible, okay. Yeah. okay. So within the limits of the physical landscape and the social acceptance, and of course we want to move as high as we can, and maybe it takes 10, 20 years to get somewhere. But yeah, ultimately that's the goal, to create more, more naturally functioning landscapes. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Absolutely. 
Another very nice question, and you hear that question often, is that uh, rewilding ecological processes need space, uh, need a lot of space. So uh, what do you think? How much rewilding is possible in places like Central Europe, but also in uh, highly densely populated countries yeah. like the Netherlands or Germany? Yeah, I think, really, I think this is a bit of a misperception that there is that it needs a huge space. And uh, if you look at how rewilding is developing, you know, now is, it, rewilding has become a sort of a new new way of, of gardening even. So you can rewild your garden, you can rewild your city park, you can rewild landscapes, you can rewild even oceans. So all the different scales are possible. And of course, the scale is an important element to see us, uh, you know, to, to, how, how far you could get on this scale of rewilding. So uh, I don't think uh, we only talk about large landscapes. I think we, uh, we can look at different scales. I've seen beautiful small rewilding initiatives of, of 100 hectares. So. Um, it's a different mindset. It's a different way of thinking. And, uh, you know, one of the misunderstandings is that it needs big space, but I don't think that is, uh, that is per se the case everywhere. Okay, thanks. Well, then there's a question about uh, large carnivores, eh? so those apex predators. They are coming up, and you see them introduced, in, they are doing themselves, eh? reintroducing themselves in the Netherlands, uh, yeah. Belgium, you see that, uh, of course, Germany, they are all over the place. What is your opinion about uh, having those apex predators in countries like the Netherlands and Belgium, and how can what what role can they play? Yeah, of course, that's a scientific, interesting scientific question. Um, I think there's another misunderstanding that in many cases it's not the predator that controls the prey, but it's the other way around. If there's many mice, I also have many chicks. If there's a lot of grass, we have lots of geese. If there is a lot of food for uh, wolves, they you know they they will thrive, and uh, so it's more the prey controlling the predator than the other way around. Of course, there is, there is, and we know the trophic cascading, we know the ecology of fear, eh, where, where predators move in the landscape and change the behavior of, of, of uh, for instance, herbivores a lot. Uh, so it's not a matter of, uh, do we have enough carni uh, predators eventually? It's, they're, they're part of the system and they will have an impact. And, um, um, and and we, we need to f we need to rediscover how this could work in a, in a human dominated landscapes in Europe, and that's one of the big research questions that I would that I would like to address, because the story of Yellowstone might not work in Europe, where we all or most of us maybe saw that wolves change rivers and that whole cascading effect might work different in Europe. A beautiful and interesting research question. Yeah. Okay. Next, <clears throat> sorry. The next question is that uh, in our type of, of countries, eh, like, um, like in Europe, we had lots of extinct keystone species, like we had rhinos, uh, we had lion. How can we repl replace them? Can we introduce analogies eh, like uh, bison or other species to, to take their place as for the keystone species? Well, well uh, bison, of course, is still a wild species, and uh, but they, they were extinct in the wild, so now they're back in the wild. Uh, analogies, you know, the only two species we work with in Europe is, uh, as rewilding Europe, is, uh, is bovines and horses uh, because they got extinct and we are looking at primitive breeds that sort of resemble mostly uh, the, the role. Th these have been the ecological engineers of European landscapes. We, uh, you know, a lot of our diversity, biodiversity and landscapes come from the interaction uh, of large herbivores. And, um, as I explained in my, my talk, uh, these are missing now in many, many areas in Europe. So if, um, if, the, if the wild species have disappeared, it, you know, you can consider to bring back analogies uh, because the ecological function might be more important than the specific animal that, that, that you talk about. And it's also important that we talk about evolution because, for instance, the aurochs who got extinct in, in Europe in 1627, I, I recall. So that's not that long ago, actually. Um, if, uh, but if the aurochs that we look at from a few thousand years ago would still be alive, it would also have evolved. It would have been a different animal. So just like nature itself, species are also not fixed. They also evolve. And so it, there is a, you know, and, and also ICN, and if you look at the, the reintroduction guidelines, is talking about uh, analogs, ecological replacements be, uh, in cases where the processes are so key for all that other biodiversity that you can actually do that. And this is really what uh, what we think. And then and what we practice, and how far you go with those species, of course, other questions come in. But we now focus on mainly on some of the large herbivores because they cannot come back easily. Uh, carnivores are actually doing very well on their own, most of them. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's sort of gradually see how this evolves and we'll see what the future brings. Yeah, okay, thanks. So there's a final question. 
uh, also given time. And there are a few people that are really re listening carefully to you. Because okay. what they were asking is, okay, rewilding should be a competitive land use. Uh, however, agriculture in many places receives still some policies, some uh, subsidies, sorry. Yeah. From the, what, what, so I guess that there are also policymakers listening now. What would you tell the policymakers in terms of subsidies going to agriculture vice versus making rewilding a competitive type of land use? Yeah, you could say um, uh, that, that these subsidies for sort of keeping systems alive that actually are economically not viable, you know, you can really question if that's the way to go. And, um, and it creates incentives for people to, to follow money and to, to grow whatever the subsidies is highest for. We see that in many parts of Europe. I don't think that is, uh, that is sustainable in the long run. And uh, apart from the fact that it, it's using tax money in a perverse way, it also doesn't de-incentivize people to look for real solutions. So if we want to sh support entrepreneurship with new types of, of enterprise and business, you know, if people just hold up their hand and get their annual subsidies per hectare, it doesn't really stimulate them to, to, to find other ways. And, uh, and this is what we're trying to work on and help. Uh, because eventually, I don't think subsidies are sustainable in the long run, and uh, so we need to look at we need to look at other solutions next to subsidies that will probably always remain. But we need to get rid of uh, of, of perverse subsidies that are that are rampant all across Europe. Okay, thanks, thanks, Frans. So now we would like to return to the results of the poll. So thanks for all of you uh, who contributed to, to the poll. And the question was about uh, the Rodopi Mountains, and uh, we asked whether what type of research, what type of studies, what type of knowledge is needed to further rewild this area. And we have several answers, uh, many people answered actually, and it's a very surprising uh, result for me. So a small part thinks we need more understanding about the role of large herbivores. Also a small part said, okay, we can develop sustainable tourism a little bit more. A large part was talking about alternative economic activities in this area. And a very large part also was talking about the diversity and the ecosystem services that we can derive from this, uh, this area. Can you reflect on that, Frans? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And it shows that uh, there is a strong connection with sort of how does this benefit people? I think. Uh, uh, the economic activities, how can they find a place that do not limiting, limit rewilding? And maybe you can even say that actually benefit rewilding, because ultimately we, we feel that uh, if we can support enterprises that are based on, and in Europe, it's actually, uh, you know, it's an area with the, one of the highest levels of biodiversity in Europe where, where it's already growing as a, as a destination for, for nature lovers. And um, uh, there's lots of opportunities to do that. So. Uh, and this is an area that has been really suffering from land abandonment. And uh, uh, linking to subsidies, you know, we see an increase in, in cattle grazing now, driven by subsidies again. And um, so, you know, I, I, I can imagine that people uh, have put this, this question about what are the economic activities that could, uh, that could be put in place uh, to maybe not only limit but also support rewilding is, is a very popular one. Because this is why people are leaving those areas. In Bulgaria, it uh, has huge problems with land abandonment. Uh, so yeah, that would be my, my comment on this yeah. one. OK, thanks for your uh, answer. So let's take a step back. Uh, so in your work of rewilding, uh, for rewilding Europe, um, can you now identify what is the most limiting factor in uh, rewilding many areas? I think one we mentioned already reverse EU subsidies. And, and I will just give you that example. We were traveling in Spain. We're talking with a big landowner. And we were discussing rewilding. And he said, please tell me, when I, I get money for re removing my fence, I get money from the EU for putting a new fence. I get money uh, for, from the EU to take out the stones of my field. I get money to, get, to plow this, this arable land, even if I don't grow a crop. And I get money to get all the bushes away. So tell me, what does rewilding bring me? And this is exactly the problem. Marginal lands are being overloaded with subsidies, creating uh, sort of incentives for people to follow that money and just do what, what the money is telling them. So that element of how can rewilding become a competitive form of land use, that's one of the biggest challenges. And this is why I want to say to policymakers that are listening here, the current cap is giving us another seven years of this. And um, this, you know, if you want to really to make the Green Deal work for nature, we need, we need to withdraw the cap and look at it again, because this will really not work for nature at big scale all across Europe. So that's number one. The second one 
is funding. And I'm not talking about funding for rewilding Europe, of course, very helpful, but I'm talking about finance in, in, in the broader sense. As I mentioned, uh, if we want to really recover nature at scale, we need investors, we need banks, we need finance institutions, we need you know, all types of money to, to public, private, or, or, or capital, investment capital to scale up. Uh, so that's another, as the second one. Um, um, and, uh, and the third one uh, is, uh, and this is what I think Paul's story, it's this paradigm shift in thinking. How do we look at nature? Very odd that if you ask somebody in Africa, or America, South America, North America, or Asia, what is nature? No one talks about small-scale agriculture. That's Europe. So we need to rethink how we look and, uh, and this awakening that we talked about. How do we see nature in Europe? Is that heavily managed by people who are cutting, mowing, putting fences, uh, shooting and burning, whatever we do to manage nature. You know, we sh we, we, my, that might be needed, of course, in, in areas, but we need to start rethinking. Uh, and, and that paradigm shift in thinking about what nature could be and this joining on this re uh, rediscovery path of, you know, what would wild nature be in Europe in the 21st century? That's, that, that paradigm shift in thinking is also a big challenge. Okay. Okay. But we're making progress. Make progress, yes. <laughs> and now talking about science. So yeah. wh where are the knowledge gaps when you talk about science and rewilding? Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's a few things, and I think I mentioned already. I think the, um, one of the, the, the questions are related to you know, this digital landscape. And, and uh, we say, well, at least half of Europe's biodiversity is depending on anything between open soil and closed canopy forest. Wilderness or wild nature is not only forest. So many different habitats in Europe. So uh, looking at, at the role of, of these sort of intermediate habitats is, is important. Uh, and that, of course, links with, with natural grazing. Uh, herbivory is, is one of the key drivers of ecology in Europe, ecological richness. And, uh, and land abandonment and, and sort of land overgrowing is, is, uh, is, is, is a, key, a key issue. Uh, the Rhodopis is a big example of that. So looking at grazing dynamics and how these landscapes move in, in sort of time and space is, is absolutely interesting. And uh, of course, interacting with, 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 with the predators and carnivores, the trophic chains that, uh, uh, as I said, you know, maybe a lot of people know the story about in Yellowstone, how wolves change rivers, because by the reintroduction of wolves now 25 years ago, they brought in this ecology of fear that pushed deer species to graze completely different, and then suddenly vegetation responded and other species came in. How does that work in Europe, in human-dominated landscape, where there's a lot of disturbance by the presence of people? So, uh, and there are scientists that are saying, ah, trophic chains and interactions that doesn't work like this in Europe. So let's see. So beautiful topic. And another one I would say, and that's, you know, these are all sort of biodiversity related topics. And there is a lot of also about abiotic topics uh, that I mentioned before. I think carcass ecology, you know, a lot of people have realized, yeah, it's good to have dead wood in the forest. And, and, and by the way, that's, that's getting a big problem now with biomass taking out of forest all over. But uh, getting used to dead animals in nature, that's another one. And a lot of our scavenging species are depending on this. And if we want to restore nature in its sort of, uh, and, and with the different uh, elements, then uh, our vulture species and many of the scavenging species play an increase, uh, in, in incredibly important role in European nature. But we have forgotten about it because we're not allowed to leave carcasses. So the circle of life is an important topic that has huge potential for interesting studies. And I hope, of course, that the research will then also help us to see how we can bring more uh, of that, you know, car the carcass uh, uh, and, and scavenging element into European nature. Just a few. Okay, examples. thanks. Yeah, okay, thanks. So you have a quite a central role in, in rewilding, eh? due to your organization, Rewilding Europe. And you meet uh, many people and you influence many people directly and indirectly. But sometimes you never meet them, and yeah. also they never meet you. So what are the things that scientists should know, or people, the practitioners should know, about rewilding practice, and to strengthen collaboration um, and improve rewilding science and practice? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. We see uh, lots, uh, you know, the publications about rewilding scientific is skyrocketing, and as I said, often opinionated. And often, that's also in the social science, I have to say, lots of views on how things should be, but not based on research or applied research or science, unfortunately. But we need to have more of that. So um, I would say uh, an open mind and, and sort of moving away from dogmas and looking at what is happening out there 
and, and follow the rewilding pra practice and, and, and learning from things that you might not even thought about. That's sort of uh, really a message I would like to, to bring across. Uh, there is a lot of open-minded scientists. I know a lot of them. And, uh, and I'm very happy that now yeah, over 20 universities in Europe are already picking this up. And um, I think uh, moving from theory to practice is really something that, that, that we need and discover new ventures, uh, new venues in science, as Paul also said. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, with, with also with Lisbeth's role as, as a first uh, professor in, in rewilding ecology, there's a huge opportunity to, to try and start working together and not competing universities across Europe on, on the topics. And everyone can specialize in a way, but we're trying to bring the scientists together to then look at those landscapes and see what happens and learn from it and, and build evidence and science and, and use those uh, outcomes and, and research results into redirecting how rewilding should take place and, and improve. So that's, I think, what I would like to say on that. OK, thanks. Now I have uh, the last question for you, Frans. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> and I think, for me at least personally, it's the most important question of today. Because if you look at the audience, then you see many young people, and many young people are the students uh, listening to us, attending the symposium, which is great. They are the future generation. What would you like to say to them? I would, say, I would like to say go out and rewild and learn from it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, the movement we have seen, the climate strikes and all of that, you know, that, that energy, I hope that can be put into many different ways and, and, and doing research and, and have a scientific career is one of them. Uh, myself, I, I deliberately choose for a practical career and because I wanted to, do, to see things happening on the ground and, and learn from that. And I hope many, many of the young generations you start building their knowledge and use their knowledge to then go out and get things done out there. Because if you look at the, eco, the, the, the decade of ecosystem restoration, 2030, that's the year. We have a 10-year period. The Green Deal is pushing, pushing, pushing. We need to see things changing outside. You know, how does nature benefit from everything we, we study and, and think about? And um, I would say, um, yeah, become an active rewilder, you build up your knowledge and, uh, and, and join the movement of uh, you know, recovery of nature in, in Europe uh, across the world. OK, thanks. So thank you, Franz. Uh, really appreciated your contribution, your presentation and the answer to your question. So thanks, thanks a great. million. Great. Mm -hmm.